Today, Dollywood welcomes millions of visitors each year. It's the biggest ticketed tourist attraction in Tennessee. While the current version of the park opened in 1986, its roots go back decades further. A Civil War themed theme park, a Cleveland Browns football team theme park, and the Silver Dollar City of the South. The path to Dollywood was quite the interesting journey. In 1866, legislation granted the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad Company permission for the construction of a railroad. This railroad, which began operations in 1882, traveled through the Blue Ridge chain of the Appalachian Mountains that divided the two states. The railroad was later given the nickname Tweetsy due to the tweet tweet noise that echoed through the hills. With a change in economy and the construction of more and more roads, the railway track became less and less popular, and in 1950, all operations were seized. Out of 13 locomotives that carried the Tweetsie name, only one survived the scrapyard, the number 12 locomotive that was built in 1917. Number 12 moved around the country, planned for display or film usage, before Blowing Rock native Grover Robbins Jr. and his brothers Harry and Spencer decided it was time to bring Tweetsy back to the mountains. Grover Robbins had worked as a lumberman in North Carolina and Florida before returning to his hometown to retire. He used to ride the Tweetsy back in the 30s when the train ran from Boone, North Carolina to Johnson City, Tennessee. Instead of fully retiring, he would attempt to create a tourist attraction one that would aim to preserve the history and character of the region. In the summer of 1957, the Tweetsie Railroad tourist attraction debuted with the iconic number 12 back in the mountains, now taking guests on a one mile journey to a picnic area and back. The attraction continued to grow from the excursion railroad into the first theme park in North Carolina. The track was turned into a three mile loop and an authentic Western town was built up around the station. Tweetsie Railroad was a huge success, and by the 1960s, 180,000 passengers were visiting each season. If you're ready for a full day of Wild West family fun, hop on board Tweetsie Railroad for an exciting trip back in time. There's plenty of action on Main Street, but watch out for those Indians and outlaws, take in the magic show, and discover more rip-roaring surprises around every bend. So come on, saddle up and head to the mountains for some old-fashioned family fun at Tweetsie Railroad. It's a blast from the past. Tweetsie, you're a blast from the past. The Robbins family decided to expand their operation after the success of Tweetsie Railroad. The obvious choice of where to go was to follow the route of the old railway track and head to East Tennessee. Come home with me to Tennessee. Come visit the home of the king, the home of the blues, and world record fishing. You ought to see the one that got away. Welcome to Tennessee, a place that'll take you back in time to the days of Casey Jones, the Civil War, and long before. Named after an iron forge and the numerous now extinct passenger pigeons in the area, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and the nearby Gatlinburg became a hub for tourist attractions. It wasn't always that way. Originally, the area was full of wheat fields and farmlands with the Great Smoky Mountains for a background. The boom came in the early 1960s, which saw the area packed full of visitors in the summer looking to ride the incline chairlift and see sidewalk art. One of these first tourist attractions in the area opened for business in 1961, just outside the city limits. The second location for the Robbins family called Rebel Railroad. Taking inspiration from Tweetsie Railroad and operating essentially the same, this time with a Civil War theme. Old West style themed tourist attractions were becoming increasingly popular, with locations such as Ghost Town in the Sky, Six Gun Territory, and Silver Dollar City all opening within just a few years of each other. Rebel Railroad would cost $1 million to create, opening on June 10th, 1961, and hope to drive more vacation visitors to the area.
In Rebel Town, the shop fronts looked exactly like stepping back in time. The country store displayed wartime goods, and guests could find snacks and drinks at the Lady Gay Saloon, the strongest of which for sale would be root beer or coffee. Inside, a piano player would take requests and play old-time songs. Visitors could also see their name in the headlines at the newspaper office or purchase a gold horseshoe with their initials on it from the blacksmith. One of the other highlights was a water-powered wagon with moving hand-carved figures showing moments in history. It was found in storage and put on show for the first time in over 100 years. After exploring the village, guests hopped on board Klondike Katie on the Rebel Railroad, with its five miles of narrow gauge track winding about the mountains. The locomotive was formerly used on the White Pass and Yukon Railroad in Alaska. The train was originally used in World War II as a US Army transportation class steam engine. Inspired by the Civil War centennial year, the full-size steam locomotive pulled six open cars led by a colonel explaining that Fort Agony up the line was being attacked and that the train must get supplies and reinforcements through. As the train pulls away, the main street of Rebel Town erupts with people waving Confederate flags. Each youngster on board is lined up and then would be inducted into the Confederate Army and issued a toy rifle to help repel attacks. A stop on the journey has a war-painted chief on a grand horse, states he wants to take all the children on board, or his tribe would attack. Of course, the rebels refuse. Once underway, the attacks came from behind burning wagons and in the woods. Once the fort is reached, cannons go off and soldiers run around and charge on horses. The tribe attacks on horseback, waving tomahawks, and begin climbing all over the cars of the train. It was up to the passengers to try and defend it with their toy rifles. Once the supplies are dropped, the journey continues back to Rebel Town with more attacks on the way. The whole experience would last around 45 minutes and operated around 11 trips a day during peak season, each taking up to 300 passengers. The action was high energy and people visiting the new park loved it. There were many accidents reported for its performers, with some even accidentally being set on fire. It was quite a realistic recreation of a battle. Rebel Railroad was just as successful as Tweetsie Railroad. One family reported it was the greatest entertainment they had ever seen. There was one issue, however. Guests visiting from the north didn't love the idea of their young children shooting up Yankees. Most places report that Rebel Railroad was changed into Gold Rush Junction in 1970, when Cleveland Brown's owner, Art Modell purchased the park. And while he did, the transition came much earlier. As early as 1964, newspapers reported the change from Rebel Railroad to Gold Rush Junction, when the park dropped the Civil War theme to become more like Tweetsie Railroad with cowboys and Indians instead. After multiple successful seasons, it was in 1969 that the park was purchased from the Robbins family. Why did Art Modell, owner of the Cleveland Browns, buy a Western amusement park in Tennessee? Many at the time believed he bought it as a tax write-off. However, the park continued to make money. After Grover Robbins Jr. sold the park in 1969, he sadly passed away from cancer the following year at the age of 50. His brothers would continue to operate Tweetsie Railroad, and it still operates today and remains in the family. 1969 saw the park advertised as the Cleveland Browns Amusement Park. Apparently, visitors would be able to experience the same excitement that the Cleveland team had always delivered. On your visit to the Western Town, you would now be able to get a free photo of your favorite Browns player. Attractions had also started to be added to expand the offering. The first major one would be a log flume. It was added to the park in 1966, just before the sale. The log ride was originally created for the 1964 World's Fair in New York and had moved to Gold Rush Junction. One enterprise in the amusement area that's doing very nicely is the log flume ride. The logs are made of fiberglass from the mighty fiberglass forests of North America and the price is 95 cents for a three minute ride or 32 cents a minute. It's recommended that you take your aunt along on this diversion, in which event the ride may be referred to as La Flume de Matant. The 
climax is a slide down the last chute, which looks as though it would soak you through, but actually sends you away only slightly moist and hardly needing a pressing. It remained in the park until 2004. For the 1970 season, the Cleveland Browns Football Club and its owner would spend around $500,000 increasing the size and amount of attractions at the park. A 180-pad RV park was added, and it saw the addition of the Scamper, a wooden wild mouse coaster which had moved from Cedar Point, bringing the total number of attractions in the amusement area to seven. The park was now bringing around 300,000 guests per season, all excited to see the train ride, ride the log flume, and the owners hoped that this would continue to grow. Additions continued to be added. Visitors could now see Davy Crockett and a Cherokee chief sign a peace treaty. The steam engine that powered the first pencil mill in America, built in 1850, would be restored and used at the park to power a woodworking shop. A toy museum was added, and in 1973, a chapel was built inside Gold Rush Junction. They chose to build this as it was seen to be a gift back to the local community. Many of the materials used to create the chapel were built in the 1800s and donated to complete the $35,000 project. They would name it after Robert F. Thomas, a well-respected mountain doctor of the area who would travel to remote patients to offer aid. Another benefit of adding the church was that the Sunday laws meant that Gold Rush Junction was not able to open on Sundays. 1960, Main Street, Silver Dollar City. Vacationers heading for the hills of the Ozarks are finding a new form of entertainment at Marble Cave near Branson, Missouri. On April 8, 1976, the park was sold again. Missouri-based theme park entertainment firm Silver Dollar City Inc., owned by Jack and Peter Hershend, operators of Silver Dollar City in Branson, purchased 384 acres of land and planned to spend $9 million in capital improvements at Gold Rush Junction during the first five years of ownership. The Tennessee Park operated under the former name Gold Rush for one season before becoming Silver Dollar City, Tennessee. The price of the sale was not announced at the time, other than it was in the seven-figure range. It was later speculated to have been sold for $17 million. They hoped they could increase attendance to the park to that of Silver Dollar City's over a million visitors a year. They planned to sell all the carnival-type rides at the park and replace them with themed rides similar to those at Silver Dollar City. The first attraction to be copied from Missouri to Tennessee would be the Flooded Mine, originally opened in 1968. This second version of the indoor boat ride opened in Tennessee in 1977, taking riders through a flooded prison mine shaft. Other attractions would also come from the original park in the following years, some of which will get their own expedition. The next major addition, Blazing Fury, opened in 1978. It was a sister coaster to the original park's Fire in the Hole, which had opened in 1972. In just a few years, the park size had increased over 30%, and as more themed attractions were added, attendance continued to rise. The authentic shops, blacksmiths, and crafters became a staple of the park with over 75 professional craftsmen demonstrating old-time skills during special festivals throughout the year. Growth continued throughout the early 80s, with the park now firmly moving away from its train ride experience of old to a fully-fledged theme park. Though the train ride that started it all still operates in the park today. Make sure you look out for Klondike Katie. The Silver Dollar City of the South was again a hit, and the changes were working with over half a million guests visiting each year. Unknown to everyone, the park was about to change one final time. Your career is in a good place. It is in a good place, and, and I'm in a good place now, but also I want to get in areas of business. I have a big dream of, of building a, a center or a city or being involved in a place in East Tennessee, my hometown up in Gatlinburg, which is one of the most wonderful places in the world, called Dollywood, USA. And this would be like a fantasy city, like uh, 
sort of like Disneyland, but like where it's like a, fa- a mountain Disneyland, like a Smoky Mountain fairyland. In 1982, the Hershen brothers were listening to a Barbara Waters interview. American singer, songwriter, and all-around icon, Dolly Parton mentioned the fact that she had a desire to open a theme park in her home state. Not wanting to compete, they reached out to her and suggested a partnership. Dolly Parton already had a connection to the park. It was that mountain doctor, Robert F. Thomas, the one the chapel within the park was named after. The very same doctor that had made a house call to deliver Dolly Rebecca Parton on January 19, 1946. 40 years later, on May 3rd, 1986, Dollywood opened its doors for the first time. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Dollywood. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. We have a lot to cover at the Tennessee Park. Which ride or attraction would you like to see first on Expedition Dollywood? Let me know in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes. And a special thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel. We will see you next time. Your trip to the Smokies really isn't complete. Unless you visit Dollywood and share a family treat. It's a magic place, good times for everyone. So come on out, enjoy a day of Smoky Mountain fun. See your favorite music stars, meet my family, and discover traditions that used to be. Get away to Dollywood, it's homespun fun. In the heart of the Smokies, five miles north of Gatlinburg.